Hey guys, just a quick thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the support, for the downloads already. I greatly appreciate it. This is only the third episode and you guys are killing it. Thank you so much. You can find the show at Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. So go over and leave me a rating, leave me a comment. If you like the show, if you're digging what I'm doing, let me hear from you. You can also post a comment on the Barstar Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash O'Reilly Drums Barstar. You can also email me at barstarpodcast at gmail.com. All that is always in the description of the shows anyway. I really want to hear from you guys because eventually if I get enough feedback and enough interest, I'm going to do a bonus show and answer a bunch of your questions and see how many of you talk shit about me. So, on with the show. The Bar Star Podcast, hosted by Stephen O'Reilly, is a podcast about working musicians, their friends, and their opinions. Stephen is a musician in Louisville, Kentucky, who has... Wait a second. This guy's a drummer, not a real musician. Somebody gave a drummer a microphone for his voice? The hell? Unreal. Unbelievable. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Bar Star Podcast. I am your host, Stephen O'Reilly, and I want to thank you guys for coming back to hang out with me, and thank you for digging the show, and I hope everybody had a good week. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope you guys actually went out and did some shit. I had a fantastic week. I got to play some drums, and as always, that makes my soul happy. Got some cool pictures from, uh, from a wedding party that my wife and I had earlier this year. So that was cool. Thank you, Travis Greer, for being such an amazing photographer and editor and having such a good eye. I don't have anybody in here hanging out with me, so today I am flying solo. I wanted to talk about something today that is kind of, well, you guys might view it as kind of morbid. Uh, I don't really think it's morbid. I I find it more interesting than anything because it's uh, there's holes left in art. And in, in music and in entertainment, I joke with my wife all the time that these are the these are the days of my life. No, I'm just kidding. I joke with my wife all the time that these are the days that that I knew were were coming eventually, and I just didn't want them to get here. Um, and that is all of all of my slash our heroes are are dying. I know that's kind of morbid, but I find it interesting to look at it and and talk about it because there's. Several artists and musicians that have died, uh, even in the last year and a half, that's just, it's crazy because they were, I'm only speaking for me, but it's crazy because they were so influential to me. It kind of sucks because when certain artists pass, at least for me, there's this weird dynamic in my brain um, because obviously I don't know these people. I've never met them. I've never hung out with them. I've never spent time with them on a personal level, on a human to human level, but some of them more than others, but some of them have been in my life in some way, shape or form for 20, 30 years. Uh, some of them have been in my life almost every day. So it's, it's a very interesting thing when an artist that you admire or look up to or are influenced by, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing when they pass because you know that nothing new will come from them. There's going to be no new songs or no new records or no no tours or anything like that. So it's just, it's kind of weird. And I don't know if that's because I'm a musician or because I appreciate things as much as I possibly can. Uh, I don't really know where it comes from. But before I run down this list, I will tell you the one that I guess a, the best term I can use is hurt. The one that hurt me the most was Prince. When Prince died in 2016, I was I kind of acted like a little schoolgirl. Uh, I actually did cry. I will tell you the truth. It wasn't funny then, but it's funny now because my wife she likes to tell the story that she's only seen me cry three or four times since we've been together, and one was when Prince died. 
I guess there's some some humor in that, but at the same time, it's it also shows what an impact he had on me musically. Um, in fact, I know in a previous episode I talked about tattoos and uh, about the music stuff that's on my left arm and on the inside of my forearm near the the big X I told you about. I have uh, the best way to describe them is bubbles, but they're not bubbles. It's almost out of focus lights is what they're supposed to represent. And they do look like it because, as I've told you before, Travis King is amazing. One of the actual circles is purple for Prince. That was the best way I could think to commemorate him. I, I debated whether I wanted to put the Prince symbol on me, but I decided to go with coloring in one of my light circles, purple. I think it's a little bit cooler because it, it makes the story of it a little bit deeper versus if I had the Prince symbol on me, somebody would look at it and go, oh, yeah, you're a Prince fan. But most of the stuff around the purple circle is all black and gray. And then I've got this just random purple circle. Purple circle. That's a weird shit. Is it purple circle? So a lot of people will ask me what the purple circle is. And I just said purple circle again. It's really cool. Maybe that should be a band name. Hi, we're purple circle. And I will explain to them that it's my tribute to, to Prince because uh, I just want to have him with me. As a little reminder, like I told you in the tattoo episode, a lot of people have reminders. and. That's my, my little homage to Prince. Or is it homage? Or is it homogenized? No, that's milk. Yeah, whatever. So there's uh, guys like Prince that have, that have influenced me, and I, I really took that one hard. And then, of course, Chris Cornell passed. That was kind of weird in a different way because Lane Staley's gone. Scott Weiland is gone. Now Chris Cornell's gone. And in a weird sense of... I don't know if the word is irony, but just in a weird kind of position, if you look at the big four that came out of Seattle in that era, it was Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Stone Temple Pilots. Eddie Vedder's the only one left alive, so that's just kind of bizarre in itself. Even though this isn't the what am I listening to section, if you've never checked out Mother Love Bone, you need to go check them out. I don't think they get enough credit. They were one of the original quote-unquote Seattle bands. Anyway, so we've lost George Michael, Leon Russell, who was part of the Wrecking Crew. Uh, that's actually a great documentary if you've never seen it. It's about the session players in the mid-60s that played on all these records. It was It was basically a band that never had a name. All they did was session work out in L.A., um, they would do three or four sessions a day. They would just go from studio to studio to studio. Uh, and Leon Russell was in the Wrecking Crew. Leonard Cohen, Merle Haggard, Denise Matthews, who you probably won't recognize her name. She was better known as Vanity. Maurice White, who was the founder of Earth, Wind & Fire. Paul Kentner, who was the founder of Jefferson Airplane. Glenn Fry, who was in the Eagles. David Bowie, who that one sucked. Malcolm Young, who just passed recently, he was in, obviously, ACDC. Uh, Fats Domino. Fats Domino really didn't bother me, which is crazy to say, but he was so old, he lived an amazing life. There was a, my wife and I went to visit her parents uh, last year, and their neighbor across the street was 98 years old, and he was very sick, and everybody was kind of freaking out that he was getting ready to pass away, and my wife's father and I looked at each other and we just started laughing. And my wife and his wife kept looking at us like we were twisted and said, well, what are you guys laughing at? And we were looking at him and goes, what, what is wrong with you? The guy died of 98. Leave him alone. He's good. Sorry, bad joke. Uh, of course, we lost Tom Petty, Chester Bennington, uh, Nick Menza, who was in Megadeth, Greg Allman, obviously, Clyde Stubblefield, who was the drummer for James Brown, Jimmy Bain, who was in Dio and Rainbow, and then Butch Trucks, who was the Almond Brothers drummer. Uh, so there's just been a lot of people in the past year and a half that have left us, and it just kind of sucks because obviously a lot of these people I grew up on and people of my age in my era, I'm in my early 40s, we all grew up listening to these people and or idolizing these people and or emulating these people. And it just sucks when you realize, holy shit, that dude's not here anymore. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get a new record from them anymore. The smart ass side of me thinks it sucks also because I don't know if there will ever be musicians or artists of that caliber anymore. I mean, we all know that there will never, ever, ever, 
ever in the history of ever be another prince. There just won't. A lot of people say that Bruno Mars is the modern day prince, and I give Bruno Mars a lot of credit. That dude's a badass, but he's not prince. There will never be another prince. I don't really know what to equate it to. I'm not sure if it's because the last couple of generations are lazy or they do things so different or with the advent of the interwebs that everything is easier and they don't have to work as hard. I don't know. All of that is speculation. None of that is necessarily my opinion. I'm just kind of spitballing. I don't think we'll ever have another Prince. I don't think we'll ever have another Chris Cornell. I don't think we'll ever have another Tom Petty. I am not a huge Tom Petty fan as far as being a fan of his music, but one cannot deny how good of a songwriter he was and what a prolific songwriter he was. I don't think we'll have another George Michael. Again, I'm not the biggest George Michael fan, but he wrote some amazing songs. And he used controversy, so to speak, to his advantage, and he kind of used it in a smart way. But still, musically speaking, uh, the guy wrote some great songs. He had some amazing records. The collaboration he did with Elton John, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, that's an amazing song. I don't care if you like that kind of music or not. Uh, David Bowie. I don't think we'll ever have another David Bowie. So it's just interesting to look at these names and think about all these people that have left us and just go, wow, not only are they gone, but there's not really anybody left to take their place. It's an interesting thing to talk about amongst yourselves. I may actually do an episode later on down the road where some of my friends and I talk about this and we compare musicians and artists of... I guess yesteryear, but we compare older artists to today's artists and see how they stack up. And I'm not saying that all of today's artists are not good. That's I'm I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying that. But if you know anything about music and you know anything about music history and you look at the landscape of today's musicians versus the landscape of 20, 30, 40 years ago, today's musicians just don't hold up. They just don't. I will go ahead and say it might be an opinion, but I lean more towards fact. And again, that's not to say there's not great players, but back then you could have, hypothetically, you could have a hundred players that were just phenomenal and make you want to quit your instrument. And today you've probably got 20. And like I said, I'm not trying to shit on any of the new bands or the new artists. I just, maybe I'm just old and jaded, but I've just noticed that a lot of the younger up and coming bands and artists and musicians, they just tend to not put as much effort in as you know the way to say it as the old dudes did. I even see it in my students. The students that I have now that are in their early teens are not the same type of students that I had ten years ago in their early teens. So it's just interesting. It's something to think about, something to talk about amongst your friends and amongst yourselves and and you can come up with your own conclusions and, and see how you feel about it. Um, but that's just my two cents on it, as normal, um, my opinions. And I just thought I would share it and share it with you guys and then give you guys something to talk about and something to chew on for a few days and see how you feel about it. So let's move on to social media issues. This week in social media issues, I wanted to talk about dirty laundry. That was really, really bad. Dirty laundry. Should it be aired on social media, especially on Facebook? I have a Twitter. I don't use it a whole lot. Twitter's one of those, I call it an online time suck. You have to spend so much time to get any return on Twitter. I just don't have time for that shit. Instagram is all pictures. We know this. I do have an Instagram. I'm active on Instagram. But I don't see a whole lot of dirty laundry on Instagram. It's mostly on Facebook. I'm sure there's a lot on Twitter. um, But most of the stuff I see on Twitter is Twitter beefs. People bitching at each other. That's a whole nother issue for a whole nother deal, for a whole nother story, for a whole nother show. Maybe. Maybe not. That one will probably make me pull my chin hair out since I don't have any hair on my head. On Facebook, I noticed that a lot of people like to air their dirty laundry. And I wanted to talk about it because I want to know what you guys think. I think it's a big pain in the ass and a big waste of time. 
However, there's also a twisted part of me that thinks it's kind of damn funny. The reason I think it's a big pain in the ass and a big waste of time is, uh, first of all, does anybody really care? It kind of strikes me as arrogant that you're airing your dirty laundry so people can be on your side and you can build up your army and everybody can take your side of the fight. Well, I hate to tell you, jackasses, there's three sides to every story. Your side, their side, and the truth. Another backlash that I've noticed is how damaging it can be, especially if whatever is being aired is not true. For example, accusing somebody of doing some shit that they didn't do. They weren't even remotely in the vicinity. They weren't even in the area of what was being accused. And I just think that's kind of shitty of people. Don't accuse somebody of something if you don't have the proof. And I don't care what it is. I'm not necessarily talking about cheating or whatever. I mean, you could have, you ain't my last cookie. It doesn't matter. Just pick something random. It doesn't have to be anything life-changing or earth-shattering. I'm just saying, if you don't have proof, maybe you should do some research before you go typey, typey, typey. Now, on the funny side of it, at least it's funny to me, and I've noticed this with a few people, even a couple of my friends, if you have a joint Facebook, one of y'all done fucked up. Because that right there is clue number one that one person does not trust the other person. So you've got that joint Facebook so you can check up on each other and keep tabs on each other. Um, if your relationship is like that, my opinion, maybe you shouldn't be in a damn relationship with that person. I'm just saying, if you've got issues like that, obviously that's some massive trust issues. You probably shouldn't be with that person. Just an observation, just my two cents, but what do I know? I'm just a dumb drummer. I just play music. Still funny, though. You might want to take a look in the mirror if you've got a joint Facebook account. What are you doing? What are you doing on Facebook? Who are you talking to? Relax. It's fucking Facebook. It's not the end of the world. So, just something to think about, something to talk about amongst your sales, and you can draw your own conclusions to, to the whole airing of dirty laundry, and then hopefully you might think about it later. Uh, if you go to post something shitty about somebody, you can look at any of my social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Well, Twitter doesn't count. I already told you that. And you will very rarely see anything on there that's super personal. Um, I mean, obviously I say things like I love my wife and shit like that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I don't really, if I have a beef with somebody, I get in their face. I call them, I text them. And maybe that's kind of the the hidden meaning of why I decided to talk about this today. If you've got a problem with somebody, tell that person. It's not really that hard. I mean, if we all gotten to the point where we can't go up to a friend or an acquaintance and say, hey, I heard you said so-and-so and I don't appreciate that. We need to figure this out. It usually works. I'm just saying you'd probably be better off doing that than getting on Facebook and saying, I ain't going to say no names, but you know who you are, and you know what you did, and I don't appreciate it, and I think you need to be taught a lesson. Oh, for fuck's sake, just please give me a break. Either come out and say it, or call that person up and say, hey man, uh, I just really need to know what the deal is with this. You might save yourself some grief. Now you know me, or if you've, you're getting to know me, uh, on the flip side of that, there are times where I think it is absolutely necessary to air a little bit of dirty laundry on social media. For example, if somebody rips you off business-wise, uh, absolutely throw them under the bus without question. Don't even hesitate. Just chunk them right under those double back tires. If a business or a bar, for the musicians listening, if a bar wrongs you, yeah, you should probably, you should probably let them know, hey, that wasn't really cool. Now. That All that being said, you can still do it tactfully where you don't come off like an angry 12-year-old girl with an axe to grind. But there are times where you can air that laundry, but you're doing it to either protect yourself or protect future business or protect people from doing further business with a certain individual or a certain establishment. Again, with me, it's kind of one of those double-edged swords. But on the personal level and on the personal side, you shouldn't be posting that your significant other put mayonnaise on your sandwich and made you try to eat it. Come on, nobody really gives a shit. So let's move on to stories from the stage. Yeah. I got a funny one for you this week. 
I was doing a tour. It was a mini tour. It was five or six dates. Forgive me, I don't even remember the name of the band, but that's not the point of the story. We were in Winston-Salem. This was probably 15 years ago, and we were opening for another band. And the band we were opening for was not, they weren't signed, they weren't national, but they were regional. They had a, uh, from what we could tell, they had a pretty decent following. But we were told when we got there that I would have to share a drum kit with the headlining band. I would have to play that guy's rig. It's known as backlining. It makes changeover very simple and very fast. Uh, Backlining means whoever plays last, the band that plays in front of them will use most, if not all, of their gear. So they just kind of can unplug their guitars. The drummer can take his sticks and his cymbals, and it makes changeover really, really quick. On the one hand, it's a cool thing because, like I said, it makes changeover really quick for... Us players, it usually sucks, especially for us drummers, because drums are all drummers all set up so differently. It's 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 not even funny how different drummers set up. For example, I've told you before that I'm vertically challenged. I'm not very tall. I'm five nine on a good day, maybe five nine and a half. But I sit the way I sit behind my drums. Most people that come and sit behind my drums think that I'm six foot five. I sit very high. I sit very far back from my drums. Uh, Everything is very, I don't want to say spread out, but it's kind of spread out for lack of better term. Um, And part of that is because I have very long arms for my body height. I'm kind of built like a orangutan, I guess. Never really thought about it. Damn, I'm built like a monkey. So being built weird, I've found over the years, over the past 25 years or 30 years or whatever, as I would start to sit higher and sit further back, I would have less body pain. My back wouldn't hurt as much. I had better control over my feet and things like that. So without boring you with all those details, every drummer sits different. So we go inside. I find the drummer for the other band and he's a, how can I put this nicely? Mm, The guy's a complete fucking dick. It's as nice as I can put it. You know, when you meet somebody and you just know they're just completely full of themselves and completely arrogant, that was this guy. He thought his shit didn't stink. So he starts giving me the list of things that I cannot do to his drums. Uh, I cannot move anything. I cannot adjust the position of any of his toms. I can't move any of his cymbal stands. Uh, I can't move anything. I just have to basically play them like they are. So we're the opening band. I don't argue. I just, all right, cool, no problem. So then I saw them sound check. And I want you to picture this in your head. A very, very evil grin coming over an already pissed off person's face. This guy was not that good. Definitely undeserving of the arrogance that he had. So, knowing in that moment that I was better than him, I just got really, really shitty. When they got done sound checking, I put my cymbals on his stand, took his snare off and put mine on without moving anything. And that was the only thing I did. I didn't move anything else. I didn't touch anything. So when showtime came and we were getting ready to go on, I saw him backstage and I said, hey, man, would you mind watching our set? Since you're the headliner, I thought maybe you could you might could give me some pointers. I know that was a total dick move. And I freely admit it. He was like, oh, yeah, man, I got you. I'll watch you. I'll check you out. So we do our set. I think we played 40 minutes and I just completely blew my wad. I pulled out every trick I had. I'm doing all the craziness that I'm known for, which is real flashy stuff. For those of you that have never seen me play, you can YouTube me. Just put my name in there. You'll find it. So I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm playing my ass off, and I do the thing. I didn't break anything. I didn't break any of his stuff. I didn't play overly hard, so I I wasn't trying to damage his gear. I was just trying to outplay him and show him that he needed to be a little bit more humble. So we got done and I saw him on the side of the stage and he was literally staring at the floor. He wouldn't even look me in the eye. Took my cymbals down, took my snare off, packed all my stuff away and I walked by him and I said, Hey man, thanks for letting me use your kit. And the next time you decide to be an asshole, you might want to check out who's actually playing. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm pretty sure it was something to that effect. And then I watched probably three or four of their songs and he was 10 times worse at showtime than he was during soundcheck. 
which I'm assuming I rattled his cage and got in his head, which was kind of my plan. Again, self-admittedly, it was an asshole move. I shouldn't have done it. It was a long time ago. I was a lot more arrogant then. I think all of us musicians have a slight streak of arrogance in us and ego to do what we do, to get up on a stage and have all eyes on us. But I did take it to a whole different level, and I shouldn't have done it. I don't regret it. I'll tell you straight up, I don't regret it. That dude was a total dick, and he deserved it. So that's my stage story for the week. I kind of had to put some jackass in his place just because I didn't like his attitude. So now it's time for what am I listening to? This week, I'm going to give you a podcast to check out. You may already know it, but if you don't, it is Talk is Jericho. Chris Jericho is a, he's actually a WWE wrestler. And I will be doing a podcast soon on wrestling, which I will explain when I get to that podcast. I'm not going to explain it today. But his podcast, Talk is Jericho, I don't care if you're a fan of wrestling or not. Um, that dude is super, super interesting. Because not only has he had a, a damn near 20-year wrestling career, he's also the lead singer of Fozzie. Fozzie started out as kind of a joke band. Uh, they did a bunch of covers, and they did some weird covers. But Jericho's partner in that band is a guy named Rich Ward. Rich Ward was in a band called Stuck Mojo. That band was phenomenal. They were, uh, I guess you could say they were the rap metal before rap metal was cool. They were from Atlanta. They started putting out records early to mid-90s. Uh, they've got four or five records, but Rich Ward was the main songwriter. They put together, him and Chris Jericho put together Fozzie, and now they've, they're just, I don't want to say they're just now starting to blow up. I mean, they've always had kind of a cult following. That band has done some really cool tours, and they've done a lot of festivals and stuff. But back to his podcast, he has a lot of wrestlers on there, but he also has a lot of people that are not wrestlers or have anything to do with wrestlers. For example, he had Craig Gass on there. Craig Gass is a comedian who does a spot-on impression of Gene Simmons, and it's retardedly funny. Craig Gass was also on Howard Stern and stuff like that. He'll have G He's had Gene Simmons on there three or four times. He's had Paul Stanley on there. He kind of goes through a lot of different people on his show, and he's just really into entertainment and the art of entertainment, uh, movies. He talks to various musicians. He's, he's talked to musicians I've never even heard of, which was really cool. And he doesn't, he doesn't pull a whole lot of punches. It is a little bit on the clean side, because I know every once in a while I drop some words I shouldn't drop, but I don't regret it. But I definitely recommend checking out his, his podcast, whether you're a fan of wrestling or not. It doesn't matter. Like I said, he's got some really cool guests. But he's had his podcast for two or three years now, I think. And it, it did start as a wrestling podcast, but like I said, he's so plugged into entertainment uh, in the entertainment world, and movies, and music, and of course wrestling, but I just think it's a really cool podcast if you've, if you're looking for something that you've never heard of that's got a lot of variety. One of his guests is Henry Winkler. He's got three or four of the people that were on the Netflix original series called Glow, uh, which was really cool. If you haven't seen that, you should watch it. You should check it out. So it's just a pretty diverse podcast that I think is worth checking out. Uh, I dig it. There's a lot of episodes on there that I haven't listened to because I just I'm not interested in the person. So uh, you can always do that. Just remember you don't you don't have to like something. You can always skip it. You don't have to listen to it uh, just because it's there. Well, that's it, kids. That's the show for the week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you'll think twice before you air your dirty laundry on Facebook. Don't throw your partner or your significant other under the bus. Maybe you should just punch them in the throat and move on about your day. And as always, I look forward to the next time we get to hang out. And thank you again for hanging out with me today on this show. And like I say every episode, go do some shit. Seriously, go. Now, go do something. Go do some shit. You can figure something out. Just try it. Just go do some shit. So until next time, I will talk at you soon.